I was born in Hazel Green, Wisconsin, 1948. I went to school uh, in Dubuque. I went to uh, Sacred Heart, uh, Jefferson Junior High, Senior. My dad worked at the Dubuque Pack here in Dubuque. Mom didn't work. My dad was in the military and, uh, and his dad and it was just, we were kind of a military family that that uh, I always thought that with the draft, I figured the day would come that I would be going. Uh, I got drafted and went in the Army. Well, when I went in, it was uh, 11 B-20, I think, uh, uh, infantry. And then by the time I get out, because I went with a, a recon unit, it was 11 F-20 when I ended up, so. It was all uh, uh, combat type training. I was in Vietnam from uh, September 68 to September 69. They assigned me to the 199th Inf Infantry and uh, when I got there then they put me in recon. Recon is a, a, a unit where the other companies go out with 50 and 100 people. Uh, we went out with six. And uh, I ended up being a squad leader with, uh, with the guys I had, so. I was based down uh, by Saigon most of the time. Uh, we were down the Delta. I was amazed at, you know, the senses, the smells, and uh, it, it was, for a little guy from Dubuque, Iowa, it was quite uh, an experience. But what they would do, I was with a recon unit, so we got our orders straight from the colonel, and he'd put us on a, a helicopter, and we'd go out in the middle of nowhere, and sometimes we'd stay out there a week, maybe two weeks. What we were supposed to be doing is uh, going out and locate the enemy, and then, uh, call in artillery and whatever we needed. What they'd do is, when we were dropped off, they'd give me a little map. It was just a little square map, and it was just part of the big map. And they'd have it where we got dropped off, and then it, it was every day how far we should go and where we should stop, and then we'd set up ambush at night. So. Uh, so we'd walk all day and set up ambush at night, so we were tired, we were exhausted. You know, we only had six people go out, so there's, everybody had to do a little more. So I carried the radio and some extra ammo and whatever. And uh, the first one I remember, uh, walking and walking and walking and it was so hot. I thought, oh my God, how are we ever gonna do this? And uh, you know, after you did it a while, uh, you just did it. Well, most of the time, uh, you're looking at the ground. Uh, you don't wanna hit any booby traps, so. They have wires that go across, so you're constantly uh, looking down and around. You have to be so alert that any little thing that looks out of the ordinary, uh, you're, you're on it. If uh, we had to walk in the, in the water because of uh, the dikes being booby-trapped and stuff, it takes a long time when you're walking in water and mud. Then you'd, you'd set up and you'd put your Claymore mines out and, and you'd put the guy with the M60 in a certain spot and uh, uh, pick the guys. There'd be, uh, we tried usually to have two guys awake all the time and then go with maybe every couple hours. If we were really tired, it was just one hour. And then you just had to trust some guys staying awake. As everybody knows, when you're over somewhere that's not your country, they know where you are faster than you know where they are. So we ran into uh, 
a lot of situations that were pretty, pretty bad. I had three incidents when I was over there that I, I thought that it was the end, that I wasn't going to make it back. And the one main one was we were uh, pinned down. Now, you got to remember, there's only six of us. Uh, pinned down, and we were getting short on ammo. And uh, I kept calling in, and we couldn't get anybody to fire for us uh, artillery because it was either the place we were at, if it was too far, or, uh, or they were all busy. Anyway, that's the time I thought, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this one because I, we had been so lucky before. And all of a sudden on the radio, I, I hear this voice saying, hang in there, you got about three minutes. And here it was a gunship, a guy in the gunship. And uh, I'll tell you what, we blew smoke, you know, we had to blow uh, red smoke. And he come right over the top of us, and he stayed right over the top of us and shot all the, the rockets and stuff. It was amazing. And he was so close that the shells they were firing would, would hit you and they were just hot. They'd burn you, you know, you'd have to. Yeah, so we were that close. And uh, I'll tell you, what a time. That's when you go, for some reason he let me live. I don't know why yet, but, but yeah. So it got pretty tense over there. I got squad leader pretty fast, and, and it's not the reason because I was so good. It goes, people getting hurt, people getting killed, and people going back home. So you go up the ladder, and if there's only six guys, you go up pretty fast. In fact, I was scared to death. I didn't think I was ready. I always liked to have uh, the older people there, the people that had been there and know what they're doing. And then all of a sudden I'm doing it and, you know, you're always as scared you don't know enough. They had us go in, I think it was with the 25th Infantry. They had just my squad go in, us six. And they put us in with the rest of them and uh, a bunch of helicopters dropped us, and I think there was probably 70 people, probably. And then they, everybody, me included, went on a sweep. Towards the end of the sweep, we kind of hid. Us six guys kind of took off on our own. <clears throat> and then when the choppers come in, they picked the rest of them up and gone. So it was close to a village, and I'm sure the village thought we were all gone, and we were still there. And that night, uh, to make it sad, was we had these starlight scopes, they called them, that you could see, but you couldn't see really good. I mean, you could tell if it was a person, but that was about it. And I remember looking through it and seeing them, walking up the dike and there was, oh, probably seven, I would think. And uh, we ended up uh, uh, setting the ambush off and it got really strange because we set the ambush off and they never fired a round, which was very unusual. So I thought, what is it? And then the more I'd think about it, I thought, you know, something didn't look right on that scope. It, it just, something was unsettling with me, so. And later on that night, we could hear a bell. It was like a bell in church. You ever heard them ringing? That's what it was. And it'd ring here, and then it'd ring over here, and it'd ring over here. And it was just driving 
me and my people crazy, you know, because you're all hyped up and nervous anyway, and you hear that bell. And for the life of me, we couldn't figure out what the hell that was. So, and then uh, the next morning at daylight, we went out and here what we put the ambush on was a bunch of kids in training. And they had, uh, they had weapons, but there was no shell in the chamber or any of them. So, I mean, it was, it was devastating to me. I was, but you had to get it in your mind. I guess you did the right thing. They were training them and see what the bell was. They were supposed to go to where, go to the bell. And, and we found that out later, but that was uh, a bad deal. It, it was, that worked on me for a long time, so. We ended up uh, going up by what well, would have been north, uh, up by Coochie was the name of the place. And uh, we had never been up there before. And that was completely different. We went up there and on the second night out, uh, we got hit. And uh, what we had was a uh, Mm, that's kind of hard. We had an ambush set up, you know, and you put your ambushes in kind of a circle. And, and what we did, there was a road that ran almost through the middle of our circle. So we figured if they come up the road, we'd have, well, I don't know what happened if, if our guys fell asleep or what, but we ended up getting some VC in the middle of our ambush. So it was really bad. So we called in artillery to go right around the circle of our ambush. Well, there was two erratic rounds and one landed right in the middle of us and I got hit. My lieutenant got killed and my radio operator got killed. And I'll never forget, I called it in and said, no, stop firing, uh, we're hit. And they said, please put your head down, there's one more on the way. And I thought, oh, shit. So the other one hit, and uh, thank God it was further away. None of us uh, got hit on that. But I helped, uh, I guess I was in shock or whatever. I. Uh, he carried the lieutenant over to the dust off chopper and put him on. And then I got the radio operator. And as I was putting him on, the door gunner and another guy in the chopper grabbed a hold of me and just pulled me on the chopper. And I'm like, you know, and here I had blood all over the place. And, and uh, I didn't even realize I was hit. And the guy later the next day said, I seen you on the first one. And I thought, if you come back, we got to get you on. So that's what they did. But uh, over there, it, you never knew what tomorrow was going to bring because you were always in danger, always. Either booby traps or, or who knows, uh, RPGs and all that. So. I was in the hospital in Coochie for, I don't know, I think they said four or five days. And the deal was I was supposed to go to Japan. They were going to send me to Japan because I had shrapnel real close to my spine. And they didn't want to take it out. They were afraid to take it out. So they said, you're going to go to Japan. And that was like going to heaven. Get me out of there. And then a day later, the colonel that we worked for came in and said, you're an amazing man, you know, you heal really good and blah, blah, blah. You're going back out. So most of the time anybody got hit was gone, but not me. Uh, this colonel liked me so well that he thought I should stay. 
And uh, I went back out in the field, but I wasn't any good. I was, I could be out on ambush and if they were firing artillery and it was anywhere close to me, I'd have them firing an illumination so everything was bright. I called in and had artillery fire every three minutes all night, and that's a lot. And my colonel was flying around the helicopter up above, and the next day he transferred me from what I was doing to his radio operator. He knew I was done. I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I never dreamt that you could have a nice job like that when I was over there because I'd get clean fatigues. I wasn't used to that. And, uh, and nice hot meals. And, but I would go up with them uh, if there was uh, combat going on down below. I'd be up with them looking down. And, and if anybody was trying to get in contact with him, I'd be on the radio or if he needed to send something to somebody. I was only with him for three months. And, and then I was, uh, I left Vietnam. Okay. I had my year was up then. And for a long time after I got back, uh, shrapnel would still be coming out, little pieces. Yeah. You'd see a little lump and then you'd kind of cut it out. And, but yeah, for a long time that happened. <laughs> Okay, when I come home, uh, we didn't have any like they do now where, where they, they actually talk to you before you come home and stuff. I ended up coming from Vietnam, I'm not sure, but I think it was 48 hours later I was here in Dubuque, Iowa. And uh, I just couldn't deal with it. I mean, I'd go to the bars and, and, you know, do what you do, fight and all that stuff. So, because uh, I, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I fit it in. And back then, they didn't want to talk about Vietnam. They wanted to act like there was no Vietnam. And that was hard for me to let go. It was hard to work, and I couldn't keep my mind on anything. And believe it or not, I found a job as a salesman, and I'd be out on the road all the time. And that's the only thing that saved me, because I'd be kind of by myself until I went to talk to people. And then I could get back in my car and, and settle down a little bit, and you had to drive to the next place. And so that, that worked for a lot of years. I did it for 28 years. And then it seemed like it all come at once. This PTSD, they told me it was like a big boiling pot. And then it, as I got older, it started boiling over, started coming over. And I just was a mess. I had one hell of a time. So I ended up going up to Toma, Wisconsin uh, for PTSD, for treatment. And I was up there nine weeks. And they sent me back home. And I was only home for probably four weeks. And I had to go back up. It, it, I was, I guess I didn't get it. So I went back up for four more weeks and come back and when I was up there they said what you need to do is you got to find something you always wanted to do and and, uh, and and do it to keep your mind off stuff so I always wanted to rebuild a car so I ended up getting an 85 Monte Carlo and stripped it down to the frame and I was working in, in I had my own shop was working in it on my own and everything was going great. And then uh, 
one day a veteran buddy of mine, Al Rao, stopped in and he was having a hard time too. He asked if he could come down and help me and I said sure. And so it was just him and I. And then pretty quick another one would come and another one and another one and another one. Then we bought a coffee machine, so they were there every morning. There was probably 12 or 15 towards the end. And then uh, uh, at noon, we, we had a pizza machine, so we'd cook pizzas. But it got to the point where I couldn't work on my car anymore. And, and that was the only thing that was kind of keeping me, keeping me level. So this friend of mine, Al Rao, and I went across the street. There was a warehouse empty across the street. And I said, let's go over and see what that guy wants for. Him and I rented that place out of our pocket and then had these vets that were coming in go over and we were fixing it up. So it took us, I don't know, three months, probably, to get it fixed up. And then we opened it up and it was amazing. We thought we were probably going to have our own little club, like, you know, a few of us vets all get together. And it ended up, uh, they were coming out of the woodwork. And we outgrew that the first year. And then we ended up going down where we are now. And uh, now, the, the last time we checked, we had over 8,000 veterans from January to January. So it's went from 12 to 8,000. And uh, we do so much. I mean, everybody that works there is a volunteer. Nobody gets paid. So all the money we get, bring in goes to help veterans. And we have three different things. We have the Veteran Freedom Center where they can come in and talk. We've got a uh, arts and crafts area where guys can put stuff together. We've got a game room with a pool table, a shuffleboard, a dart machine. We've got a huge kitchen where you come in and eat, play cards, do whatever you want. And a, a huge, complete wood shop where our veterans make their own ink pens. They make all kinds of stuff. And that, again, is to keep their minds off of stuff. And we've got what they call Operation We Care. What that is, is we help all veterans and their families. Now this is through walkers, wheelchairs, financial help, whatever we can do to help them, we do it. And then we have another one that's Give a Vet a Lift, where we buy a new van every two years. And that takes, it picks the veterans up here in Dubuque and takes them to Iowa City to their appointments and brings them back, and we do all that. Thank God the people in the tri-states are helping us, but we get to help a lot of vets that way too, so.